Hi, I'm Ellen Gunning and I'm the Director of the Irish Academy of Public Relations. I'm also a Council Member of EDEL, the European Association for Distance Learning. The purpose of this series of videos is to meet the members and today I'm delighted to be meeting Esther Chesterman, the Chief Executive of NEC, the National Extension College in Cambridge, UK. Esther, thanks for joining me. It's a pleasure, Ellen. Lovely to e-meet you. <laughs> and, and to e-meet you too. <laughs> Let me take you right back to your primary degree, because yes. your primary degree was in law, but you seem to have worked all your life in education. Now, I, I know you love the law and we'll come back to it again later, but did you ever work in the law or did you go straight into education? No, no that's, that's a really good question. Um, I suppose in some respects, going back to my upbringing, which was very working class, and my parents didn't go to university, very encouraging of the five of us, though, to move forward with our education. But I was the first to go to university, and um, our, our A-level results were actually lost on the train on the day that we wow. were due to get them. And I received much better results than I'd expected, but clearing was all got in those days. It was all very different. You were phoning up, you know, trying to get through to the university. And it anyway, was a I, really big deal, your oh, A-level results. absolutely. Much more absolutely. than it is now. Yes, walking into the head teacher's office to receive your slip of paper. Absolutely. Um, so I, I, I then went and studied law, which was really just because somebody sat next to me on the um, UCAS application form had put law. And I, my parents didn't really have an understanding of how applications work to university. So it was a real sort of journey for me of learning. And it was a journey of learning who I was more than the subject. So I enjoyed the subject. I enjoyed studying it. But I realized actually practicing law wasn't where I wanted to be. OK. Um, I early on felt that perhaps the degree wasn't quite the right degree for me. I did, did then go on to study it in, as an adult a master's in law, actually. So I did that when I had three little children. But I, I left university and went into, um, I joined a graduate program at Arcadia, which was um, a retail organization. And I moved through into management and then training. So that was the route I took at that point. And that was really good, a really good grounding. I think anything to do with service, customer service and sales, really good grounding for understanding people. And that's where my journey then into education went. And was it the training element then that particularly caught you and you thought, I want to do more of this in Absolutely. whatever way? Absolutely. At the time, I was um, deputy manager of principals in Marble Arch. And um, obviously, I was in my 20s, had lots of energy then. <laughs> um, really you, early you start. You look like a woman who still has lots of energy, well. now, I have to tell you. <laughs> Really early starts, really late. Um, but I took on um, the role of training all the new managers who came through, you know, from, from the organisation. And I really enjoyed that. So then I moved into training roles and then moved into um, teaching and education from there. And training is a really good grounding for teaching and education because it gives you a real understanding of how difficult it can be to impart knowledge to somebody on the other side. So yeah. you're almost starting from the other side of the fence. Is what will people learn um, in, if I adopt this style of teaching? So you, yeah. you went into education and you're now chief executive of NEC, which is 60 years old this year. Yeah. I'm not familiar with NEC. Tell me what it is, what it does. And what are you doing to celebrate your 60th birthday? Yeah, yeah, it's a big one. So I'm so proud to work here. We had our birthday party on Wednesday. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So the National Extension College, it was actually started 60 years ago as a pilot for the Open University. And we work very closely with the Open University, a really key strategic partner of ours. So Sir so Michael Young and Brian Davis, who, who set up the organisation, um, they were really looking for a way of people to access education if they hadn't been able to get to the grades or the qualifications they wanted in the beginning. So Which it makes was, sense, actually, for an alliance with the Open University. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So that whole aspect, Ellen, of Same open ethos. access. Yes, very much. So we share that, that mission and we're very mission driven and we are not for profit. We are a charity. Um, so through the years, obviously, it was a correspondence college at the, at the early, earliest part of its, um, its, its sort of you know, birth. And then it moved forward into online learning. So we are online distance learning now. Um, our student cohort has also changed over the years. Um, it's now a, a sort of about 65% are under 24. 
Um, so we're finding a lot of younger people who perhaps are looking for um, a GCSE or A level, that's our, our prime subjects. Um, perhaps they didn't manage to um, get the grades they wanted in the first point, or they're looking for a change, either change of degree, change of career, suddenly looking to go into an apprenticeship and need a GCSE, maths and English. So we are open access. We are, we always say 13 up to whatever age. Um, and we still are very, very proudly lifelong learning. So we still have a, a huge group of students each year who are looking to study from a lifelong learning perspective and that real soul of what lifelong learning is. And do you still have that close association with Open University? Are you a feeder college for them? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So in a sort of um, practical way, students can get a discount between us and them, which is really nice. Um, we meet very regularly. We're part of their social partner partnership network. Um, so we have a lot of conversations and meetings with them and ensuring that we do stay aligned and st stay across policy. Um, government policy, any uh, sort of joint lobbying we want to do around changes in regulation or legal changes. Um, because our, our students, they're marginalised already. So we want to, as much as possible, remove all those barriers. Um, things like sitting the final exam, making sure they have access to that. If they have any access arrangements or disabilities, how do they manage that as a private candidate? So we work with all our partners to enable that as smooth a possible journey to the final examination and grade for the student. And give me an idea about the numbers. What number of students do you deal with each year? What, how many yeah. have you got on staff? Yeah, it's usually two to 3,000 students enrol a year. So a reasonably small college, but what that means is we can be very close to each of those students um, as a distance, but close. We have a tutor faculty, um, and that's just just under 100 who look after our students with its tutor support So the students. So they're not meeting this tutor. They have messaging with them through our platform and the tutors there as a guide. They're marking the students work and really moving them forward to that final assessment. And are you doing distance or do you do blended? Is it strictly at a distance for the student? Good question. So traditionally, we were always distance, but we, we do have some of our courses which are slightly more um, structured. So they have a framework around them. You join a cohort and we do have some live delivery within those as well. So students can choose. Some students want completely asynchronous because they have so many commitments in their life that they don't want to be able to. They can't attend a 10 o'clock lesson um, and they just want to be able to study in their own time when the children are bed or when their daytime commitments are finished but other people yes they do find the time to then join the the set lessons and tell me about your 60th celebration now you said you celebrated on wednesday what happened yeah well we're celebrating all all through the year actually so we've got a bursary which we we're just about to announce the winner of our 60th bursary so this is a student who really we feel embodies who we are as an organization we're planting a tree locally hopefully an oak tree we've got to find out because that's our emblem from an acorn to an oak then it should be an oak tree <laughs> exactly we hope so um and then we've got a partner charity center 33 which is a local charity in cambridge we're supporting for the year and they help young people move forward with their lives when they've, they've had some sort of trauma and apart from that we had a, a large celebration at a local venue on Wednesday where we were delighted to invite some of our old trustees some of our staff who were with the organization from the 70s who are local okay. as well um, and our ex-CEO Dr Ros Mos Morpeth who you may know um, who gave a lovely speech around the history of NEC and who we are and the strengths and values that we're moving into the next iteration of the organization as well. That's a lovely link with the people who joined when you were absolutely brand spanking new yes. and didn't know what you would develop into yes. to come back and say, wow, this is where we've come to 60 years on. You said that you work with a lot of mostly marginalized students, mm. so the students who wouldn't have opportunities in other ways. Yeah. I'm taking a little leap to the left here now, but is that what got you involved in the Global Girl Project? I was uh, fascinated by this. I had yeah. come across it before, and I love that the mission was something like changing the world one girl at a time. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for mentioning them. So Global Girl Project, yes, a real passion of mine. Um, I was lucky to join um, two, two and a half years ago. 
Um, so it's a very grassroots charity and we work across um, really tough areas. Um, so Jordan, South Africa, Colombia, I, I could name about nine countries we're in at the moment. Haiti is one of the places that we started. And we, we work with girls, young girls and young women. And we're, the ethos of Global Girl Project is to help those girls find their voice. So it's really working with girls in their local language. So that's quite unique. A lot of charities go in and then it's about upskilling from an English language perspective and then working yeah. with the girls. We choose partners, local partners, who then um, deliver a programme of education, because I'm still an educator at heart, which is about leadership skills. So again, the girls finding their voice in a community where girls' voices may not be seen or heard. Um, they join a group and the facilitators help them develop sort of soft skills around leadership and speaking, and communicating. And at the end of the programme, they deliver a community project. And we've had some fascinating topics, some around um, quite big issues around young marriage. Others could be a climate project that they're looking to sort of educate their local community on. Um, and then we try to move forward with the girls and young women to keep them connected to ourselves and each other. So we have a Global Girls Connected um, alumni where we keep their, their journey with us and we try to support their journey. We fund education for them, post their um, course with us, or we help them find work. And we, we, we travel with them a little bit through their journey as young women. And what do they, impossible question, but what do they typically do? Because I'm conscious the countries that you're working with, very often women don't have the same opportunities in school, mm -hmm. but that could be because of the, the fact that it's unsafe to travel mm -hmm. uh, by mm -hmm. foot to across mm -hmm. long distances. They generally leave school earlier, so they have fewer opportunities. But all of the research, as far as I know, shows that women, if you invest in women in the community, with the greatest respect to men, you get much more bang for your buck. They, they invest much more in other women, so they, they expand the community, whereas men aren't inclined to. So what are your kind of graduates typically? What do they go on to do? Yeah, and I love that aspect, Helen, that you put around that community that they build. And that, that's one of the strengths of, of the project, we feel, um, because not only are they developing a community of girls themselves, and they draw strength from that, but they, the partners and the girls, we work with the community very closely. So um, what often happens is the families of the girls and, and the elders and the community see the value, as you say, see the value and start to understand the value of women who are empowered. And therefore, they will then move forward, whether it's a small um, entrepreneurial project, because education, as you say, it can be quite challenging to, to carry on with some of the girls. So it's around them actually leading something within their community. So those small steps can obviously, as you understand, with education can, can be huge because other girls coming behind, they see this. They see the development of the girls. They see that, yes, you could start a small business in a local community. You could travel and do, do carry out education somewhere else. So it just opens those horizons for the girls themselves and those coming behind. Super initiative. How long is it running? Um, oh, that's a very good question. I think it's about eight years, but very small at the beginning. And we're now at a really lovely pivotal stage where we've got employees now, which for, for small charity is is challenging. Lovely group of um, board members and trustees um, and the founder, Julia Lynch, is amazing. Um, so we're looking at um, co new corporate partners. We've got some. So we're really as it is always the case with a small charity, fundraising is the key. Money. Um, so, yeah, so it's looking at how we can, um, um, you know, sort of put forward this story more strongly and make sure that the girls have the opportunities that we want to fund. And how did you choose the countries? How did the charity um, choose the countries that you're in? Yeah, so we, we always look for, Julia would speak very well on this, um, it's, it's around being in the global south. They have to be in the global south. There has to be um, some aspect where girls' opportunities and other charities perhaps aren't working in the same way. Okay. Um, so, so we've you've identified a gap. gap. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we're filling a gap there. Um, and then sometimes it's also born up by what local partners we can find as well. So we, we you know, we have quite um, sort of due diligence and strict element around our local partners, and they need to work with us. It has to be, as we've said, with the National Extension College and the Open University, has to be a shared ethos around how we work and operate. And that's a good starting point. 
Sounds like a great board to be on, I have to tell yes. you. Now, you mentioned due diligence, which kind of brings me back to education, which is <laughs> what we're supposed to be talking about. You went on to do a master's in law and your, mm. your master's in law wasn't due diligence, but it was company foundational law and it was very much around corporate governance. Yeah, which is a yeah. Pet of mine, right? Okay. I know that you've used... me on it. <laughs> oh, it. It's actually, I think it's one of those areas, if you look at the focus at the moment on ESG, environmental, social and governance, mm. everybody seems to get the E and the S. The governance is the piece that people don't seem to concentrate on as much, maybe because it's not as consumer driven. Now, I know you've done a lot in terms of governance within the NEC, but mm. I wanted you to look a bit wider for me and tell me, what do you think is the state of governance generally in online education or distance education? Gosh, that's a fascinating question. I, one that probably I'd struggle to answer. I can answer from a perspective of what I feel governance is looking like at the moment from a from a board perspective. I'm, I'm on a few, few boards, luckily. Um, I think the area of when I was studying director's duties was the big, you know, that was the, the new law had come out and it was around what that looked like. Then it moved to risk and risk management had to be really at the heart of what a board was doing and looking at. And as you say, now it's just moving on to about sustainability practices, which is really, it, you know, that movement is really good. I think, as you've rightly said, Ellen, I think perhaps there's a misunderstanding of what that actually is and how it's actually lived on the ground. And that's always the problem with boards and the executive. It's what a board is saying and doing and responsible for, and then what the executive is actually implementing. Sometimes there's a disconnect between those two. Um, I don't know what, what the answer to that is. One of the boards I'm on, we try very hard to work very closely with the executive team and help them feel supported, not scrutinized in the wrong way. Um, it's generally, I think it's down, good governance is down to that relationship building between people. <laughs> Interestingly, I wonder whether that is more of a challenge now that we are generally meeting online more as boards, which has advantages because people, you know, your attendance is better. People tend to be. But I'm wondering whether you miss that re really strict, strong relationship building between the executive and the board. And that's going to be an interesting area, I think, to to explore further. It'll be a very interesting one because I think part of good governance, as you know, is that you actually you live it. It's it's kind of in your DNA. You instinctively say this is the right thing or the wrong thing. All right. I need to check this. This doesn't feel right. And I don't know how much of that. I don't think you can do that fully by distance. I think no. part of that is it's the people. It's the face to face. It's saying no, Esther wouldn't be happy with that. So maybe I need to bounce it by her and make sure that's the way we do it. But it's an interesting piece that boards are becoming more conscious of it, which mm. I suppose is really good. And do you mm. see anything different about online education, governance and online education rather than any other sector? Or do you think they're all going through the same quandary? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure, Ellen. Um, obviously, from a sustainability perspective, online hits quite a lot of markers quite quickly, <laughs> which is very good. Um, but there, I wouldn't say there's anything unique that I've seen myself, and it may be something that you've seen, Ellen, I don't know. Um, but there's nothing unique I've seen about the, the governance aspect of online or distance learning. Um, potentially, perhaps because online is perceived as being more sustainable, more environmentally friendly, um, less risk apart from the IT aspect. Perhaps there's some complacency coming in. That's just a thought. I don't know. I haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps, therefore, the sector may need to think, well, can we do more? Is there something more innovative we can do and move forward just by being online and ticking all those sort of sustainability boxes? Perhaps there's a little bit more we can do to make sure that we are fully thinking of that. I think you've actually hit on the reason why the most recent EDL Summit um, was on sustainability because there there is exactly that feeling that it's online it must be sustainable yeah. and people don't actually drill down into it and see how sustainable actually is yeah. it let me keep you on kind of um, topic topics broadly related to mm -hmm. education online education in particular chat gpt mm -hmm. that everyone adores or hates so I've been looking at coverage that says some companies, I looked at one where a wonderful school in New York absolutely banned the use of ChatGPT completely. Mm. And the article said, and the students are likely to go home and ask ChatGPT, how do they get around the ChatGPT regulations? <laughs> Which struck me as being very clever. But Harvard have recently said they will applaud the use of ChatGPT in finding your sources. So not in, in writing the research for you, but in mm. helping you to distill the sources that are most relevant. 
What's your take on chat GPT and online education? How is it going to affect the industry generally? I feel sometimes a bit exhausted by it. And then I just like something new. You know, I like a challenge, but this was the okay, right? Get our heads around it. We're very lucky on our board that we have um, head of research for Cambridge Assessment, Sanjay Mystery. And he de he delivered a lovely speech at our um, birthday party on Wednesday, just giving a sort of overview of perhaps their perspective of how Cambridge Assessment is looking at it. We, we're regulated by JCQ, so we're following their guidance at the moment. That's as far as we, we've we've gone in that perspective. And their online learning team are also developing an AI module for our students. So we're wanting to um, be on the front foot. We're wanting our students to understand what it is because our students age from here to here. So some of them may be living it and feeling it. So others, maybe I haven't got a clue. And we feel it's our duty to really inform our students of what it is, how to use it effectively um, for their studies, because then it creates that equality. Um, because some students may be really sort of across how to use it to um, inform their, their judgments and some of the things that they're writing. Others may not. So we want to ensure there's a quality of understanding across our student body. The next element is to have an internal AI strategy. So we're working on that at the moment. We're testing a little bit of course design using AI as well, but mm -hmm. looking at how the quality assurance of that works and what layer do we need to put on. So we're looking at it from lots of different angles, Ellen, as I'm sure other members of EADL are. Um, and we'll, I think within the next year, though it will have changed, but in the next year, we'll have some form of framework around AI from our perspective, what we do internally with AI and how we want our students to work with it. So that's the outcome we're looking to achieve. It's interesting that that's the, the, the per, where you started from on the Irish Academy of Public Relations. We started by including um, chat GPT in the courses that we teach so it's like how do you actually use chat GPT and our focus was on the ethical use yeah so if you're going to produce something you really you have a duty to say to somebody this isn't my work yeah this is yeah. chat GPT or this is seriously enhanced by chat GPT or whatever so I, I think it's going to be one that we'll all be living with for another year or two it is it but it's is. a game changer it if you is. think of it as a game changer for online education what do you think online education? You said when you started, it was all those, you know, almost write me in pen your answer, put it into a post box. It, it seems Neanderthal at this stage. It wasn't that long ago. Now everything is online or blended. What do you think is the, the future of studying? If with chat, yeah. with all this micro learning, where do you think it's going? Yeah. So we're sort of having conversations around this at the moment uh, there's there's always opportunities and threats with anything like this and it is obviously revolutionary what's happening at the moment and we're watching it we're witnessing it the aspect of threats i think from our perspective if um, a student feels they can ask chat gpt or uh, some sort of other ai aspect to create an a-level course for them there you go that may be there so we need to, as a, as, a, as a sect, I suppose, look at what are the other aspects of what we deliver that have real value to students' progress and their understanding of learning. So we're focusing a lot on our tutors. And it, it was lovely, A-level results were on Thursday and all the messages from our students, it wasn't the course material, that it's my tutor was really important, the feedback the I got from the my tutor, it is. Um, so we need to make sure as a sector we're putting that forward, that online distance learning, fantastic. We all really get behind that. But there's people behind all the, all the online distance learning, and they're the ones that will make a difference. They're not a bot. They're not a, you know some sort of augmented reality. They are a real person who understands how the skills and knowledge to be able to embark um, their own skills and knowledge to you, but also to enable the feedback to move you forward, to make sure that's personalised. We are looking at adaptive learning and personalized learning that can have automation, and that's really valuable as well. So a student can start to feel they've got a personal journey through the material. If you look at Duolingo, they do that really well. You know, you, you're here, okay, you've answered that correctly, now you go here. So again, I think it's something that we as a sector need to look at. Think about, okay, online distance, how can we make that adaptive and personalized? My concern with AI is that exam boards, summative assessment, they will become twitchy about private candidates, distance learning candidates, how are we authenticating their, their work? For a, 
interestingly, the government tends to have gone back to very linear, very exam based learning anyway, whereas obviously you've probably been in this cycle with me. There was a moment where we were moving to coursework applied learning, which you know we, we won't debate that today. So I, I, I've got a concern that for private candidates who are already facing some forms of barrier to the assessment, this may become more challenging for them because it, it will become much more exam based because at the moment that seems to be the only way the exam boards feel they can take away the threat of AI and the, the threat of authentication. So it's a, something to watch, I think, Ellen. It's a it's a reversal of everything of the way that we've been going for a long time. Absolutely. And I, I just leave you with the thought that if, if I was in the NEC, I think you're right that you're focusing on the human to human. It's the tutor input. And I think if you did a continuous assessment rather than exam, your tutor will know the level that your student is at. So a tutor will very easily recognize a piece of work that hasn't come from the student who says Absolutely. it's their own work. Absolutely. Whereas sitting an exam, I'm still not sure that there isn't a way of cheating no. sitting an exam. No. I'm sure if you no. want to, you'll find a way around it. Esther Chesterman, I could talk to you for 100 know, years. Definitely. Thank you so much for that chat today. I really enjoyed it. Continued Thanks, success Ellen. for the next 60 years and beyond with the NEC Wonderful. in Cambridge. And I look forward to meeting in person at the next yes. EADL event. And my, myself, Ellen. Thank you. Some really, really insightful questions. And I enjoyed chatting with you about it. Thank you. Thanks a million. That's all for me for now. Until the next Meet the Members. Take care.